bit of a gory topic, but it's actually quite a common exam question and definitely something you have to know. And you're going to see them and treat them. Even if you're not a foot specialist, you're going to, you're going to have to know a bit about it. So, um, yeah, let's get straight into it. I mean, when it comes to diabetic foot as a topic, there's just three entities that really need in-depth understanding and you need to have good treatment algorithms. One is management of diabetic ulcers. A lot of the time they may be managed by vascular surgeons and general surgeons, but you will have a role to play with either tendon releases or transfers or in, in some instances treatment of osteomyelitis. And then Charcot neuroarthropathy, which some of you know a little bit about. Then, of course, trauma in diabetic patients, which I'm just going to touch on, particularly with ankle fractures. There. You know, this is a massive problem. It's a huge, huge cost to most developed countries and, and developing countries. There's a 25% lifetime risk of a diabetic ulcer in, in, a diabetic, in, in any diabetic. And your chance of death at five years after an ulcer is two and a half times higher if you develop an ulcer and 20% lead to an amputation. So it's a big problem once you get a diabetic ulcer. And as you can see, big cost to the American fiscus. Sir. And we kind of know about the pathology of why it becomes a problem in the extremities with degeneration or changes in the vascular system, micro and macro vessels, neuro, nervous system demyelination, glycosylation, and then the poor immune system with lazy white cells, polymorphs. The collagen also changes. The collagen cross-linking changes and collagen becomes more stiff and less supple. And then in the skeletal system, osteoporosis, and then of course the Charcot system, uh, Charcot process, which we're going to touch on, which if you look at uh, diabe diabetics as a population is relatively uncommon, but one and a half to 2% of patients will develop a Charcot foot from diabetes. What's much more common is a diabetic ulcer. Just remember, those are two different entities. Obviously, many patients with Charcot develop ulcers, but most patients who develop ulcers don't have Charcot. They have a neuropathic foot where the bones are relatively in place. There's no instability, but they have an insensate problem and uh, an increased pressure. Um, to treat these patients would require a specialized unit which exists where resources permit with these specialists and um, I've been in, in a unit in the UK it was fantastic you don't really have to get your hands dirty there's a technician to do the TTC the total contact costs there's a wound therapist to deal with the wounds all you have to do is take the glory and do the operation the vascular surgeon unblock the pipes so it would be the ideal situation where you had all of these specialists helping you. On evaluation of any patient with a suspected diabetic foot or with um, an ulcer, you've got to check the skin sensation with the Semis Weinstein um, sensory um, fibers. None of us really do it, but it's got something to go right down in your exam answer. But uh, yeah, obviously we just see where the sensory changes stop and end. And then looking for trophic changes, Doppler, toe pressures, um, ABIs, and tissue oxygenation. These are, are things that you can also, you know, it'll come up in your multiple um, choice type questions. And then when it comes to assessing for neuroarthropathy, you've got to check for joint stability, swelling, um, deformity, and then, of course, for any contracture of Achilles tendon or um, weakness of tib ant and um, anything that causes increased pressure or loading or deformity. And then the physician with your guidance can, can, can manage their diabetic control there. So when it comes to the pathogenesis of, of ulcers, um, it's multifactorial, but most of the time they have a motor neuropathy. So often you'll find that they'll have um, contracture of the Achilles tendon, 
and slightly weakened um, anterior compartment. So they have a forefoot overload. Um, of course, they have a sensory deficit, the loss of protective sensation. They also have an autonomic dysregulation. So they don't have any sweating. They don't have the ability to moisturize the skin. So this is a pretty cracked and, and bad environment, no hair, and um, can't manage changes in temperatures, can't feel surfaces. So they start forming callus over prominences. When you get subcutaneous hemorrhage, you can only handle certain pounds per square inch for your tissue. And then with repetitive load, um, you start developing these hemorrhages and then obviously an open wound. There obviously are extri extrinsic factors as well, like um, shoe wear, occupation, prolonged standing, whatnot. And then once you get an ulceration, then with their poor immune system and then the possibility of a full-blown infection. So that's diabetic ulceration in, in summary. Um, what are the available sort of modalities to treat diabetic ulcers? The best and most well-proven is to offload that part of the foot with a total contact caster. You can use cam walker boots and offloading shoes, but the best is a total contact cast. I'll show you some pictures of how to put it on. And obviously, wound therapy is pretty important. Um, um, with uh, wounds, diabetic ulcers, you need to know the Wagner classification, which is pretty straightforward, 0 to 5, 5 being pretty pretty bad gangrene of the whole foot. But the um, when it gets to a grade 3, grade 4, that means there's localized osteomyelitis, and it certainly needs urgent surgical care and um, involvement of orthopedic surgeon. More superficial diabetic ulceration often doesn't need surgery and uh, can be managed by a wound therapist, perhaps release of the, of the Achilles tendon if it's um, particularly tighter. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the take a message with these ulcerations and to be honest, most Diabetic ulcers are not managed by an orthopedic surgeon, but you do, of course, get them when they come into, into your practice when they have a grade three, grade four wound. But until that point, you can stress to them and the treating practitioner that prevention is the best, inspection, all of those sort of things that can improve the skin condition and um, wash their shoes, inspect their feet regularly. And uh, and when there is threat to the skin, get them off their foot with a total contact caster. Even if they have a walking total contact cast, not, Myerson showed that 92% of his diabetic ulcers healed with a total contact cast. And this is the way to do it. There's a very large reduction in forefoot pressure. Heel pressure is not reduced quite this, as well. So if you have a heel ulcer, often they have a quite a, a vascular component and they'll certainly need re revascularization often when it's a four foot ulcer this can really be well treated with um total contact casting um of course it must be uninfected it must be pretty dry and um, and and you can treat the wound until it's dry and then put them in a total contact cast and put gauze between the toes stocking it well padded, remember these people are insensate, often from mid, mid chin or around the ankle, and then um, cover the toes and then casting up to just below the knee. And these casts sometimes need to be on for three months. Of course, you change them serially. The best treatment is to change them every two to three weeks as they become a bit looser or worn. And uh, if, once the ulcer starts looking a bit better, you can get them weight-bearing again. Remember, this is a bit of a different scenario to a Charcot footer. These are just trying to get the ulcers to heal. Now, this randomized controlled trial looked at the difference of a total contact cast to a cam boot to a wedge shoe, and the ulcer eradication was much higher, significantly higher, statistically significantly higher in the total contact cast group with 63 patients randomized. So, you know, it is labor intensive and 
if you have a technician to help you or you have time on your hands, then you can certainly get rid of a lot of these ulcers. So also in improving forefoot healing with an Achilles tendon release or hoke certainly shown significant pressure reduction and improvement in the in the in the ulcer healing. Yeah. When it comes to grade three and grade four, um Wagner stages, that's um, gangrene or osteomyelitis, you've got to get in there and be aggressive, excise all the necrotic tissue down to the bone, get rid of dead bone, and then culture-specific antibiotics for six weeks. And then with all of these cases, have a vascular consult and make sure that there's good perfusion, otherwise it's never going to heal. These are the most common bacteria in a diabetic foot staph and then um, a couple of the gram negatives, less common there. Often it's a bit of a zoo and you've got to be in consultation with the ID team and get the right thing. I, my wound um, care team, they use a lot of silver nitrate type dressings. It's really good bacteria static. Um, once they get through the phase where they don't need a vacuum dressing, and this just helps that, that environment become, um, become devoid of bacteria. So... In summary, diabetic ulcers, just remember, it's a bit of a different entity to Charcot foot, which we're going to touch on now. It's more commonly treated by wound care therapists, vascular surgeons, and general general surgeons. But our role would be to treat osteomyelitis, to debride, to release the Achilles tendon or bony prominences. Um, and the classification that you should, you should remember what that is the Wagner classification and the Simmons Weinstein monofilament skin testing. You know, what the what that 5.07 millimeter testing is a threshold. None of us ever do it, but it's worth knowing. Any questions about the like diabetic ulceration? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Charcot neuroarthropathy or Charcot foot, Charcot joint disease. Um, when you look at these pictures, it looks like a bus is ridden over this foot and it's totally abnormal. You can't believe something so radical could happen to, to, to one's foot just with, just with walking around or with um, some disease process going on in there. But the two theories as to why this happens is one that there's some sort of minor or moderate traumatic event, like often patients will say they were totally fine and had a little ankle sprain, and then the foot blew up, became seriously swollen, and and, and the deformity ensued. So there's a, a micro or, or moderate trauma um, etiology, which seems to trigger off this radical um sort of process of fragmentation and destabilization. And then the other um, theory is that there's an autonomic dysregulation, which in my mind, I think is a combination of the two. But uh, in many instances, patients will say that there was no injury or anything. They're just walking and uh, over, over time, the foot became very deformed. So when I mean autonomic dysregulation, the and I'll go into some of the sort of more detail now, but the micro and macro perfusion of, of your limbs is controlled by obviously nerve endings. And when they when the control is lost, the whole rank rankle uh, bone metabolism signaling pathways go haywire, and then you become hyper perfused. Often patients with Charco have bounding pulses. It's very, very rare to have patients with a Charco foot and um and no pulses you do sometimes but most of the time that you know almost need hyper perfusion to to get this uh, the hyper metabolic in in that affected limb then. most of the patients seem to be either very long-standing diabetics so maybe not diagnosed for a long time or have long-standing diabetes and the majority are insulin dependent uh, so what takes this situation, you can see this patient here just started getting a little bit of fragmentation here, quite a swollen foot at that time. And uh, and then 
in 2019, 2020, and 2021, the shit hits the fan and the switch stop totally collapsed and unstable and the vicular just disappeared. Taylor's has dipped into plant affliction. Um, and the situation, these crazy situations here, what's what's happening with the bone? How can it get so radically destroyed? And um, we know that this is a hyper-inflammatory situation with increasing tumor necrosis factor interleukins and total dysregulation of um, bone metabolism and osteoclast activation. But it also seems to affect ligaments and joints to get that um, kind of disruption. You know, bone metabolism is highly complex with thousands of coordinated genes. And this process seems to cause a dysregulation in, 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 um, in this bed because of poor tissue perfusion, which it isn't, or glycosylation, release of free, free radicals. Um, you know, there are a lot of theories. No one really knows exactly why it goes so haywire. Um, this is a complicated picture of which you you know pick up in the textbooks. I'm not going to go into the details here, but how um, the rank rankle and osteoclast signaling pathways are disrupted with them um, with the Charcot footer. But the the crux behind it is this metabol sorry inflammation, and with very low vitamin D levels, high parathyroid hormone levels, and then with the glycosylation of the tissue and ligaments. And poor cross-linking, um, the, uh, the collagen and supporting structures are pretty poor, together with this uh, this bone fragmentation. So, uh, just uh, these are slides I used in a very technical talk in the UK. It's just a, it's a bit boring. Eh? So, so the diagnosis is made. Um, what what now? Well, first of all, you need to um, you need to look at your host. Sometimes you've got some problems like pushing water bucket up a hill. It's not it's not so easy, um, and you've got to exclude an infection. So I'll show you another slide now. But um, this is a severe impact on the on the patient's quality of life. I mean, these these people have a much lower life expectancy when they're diagnosed with a shock of foot. And our goal is to, of course, treat any, any infection at the time, but then to prevent skin ulceration, prevent infection, and return the patient to a plantigrade foot that's chewable and maybe braceable. Non-operative care, total contact casting. You can put a, uh, like in this case, a little... Um, shoe on underneath the, the cast once they become more stable um, and then try and prevent the deformity. Then with medical management, it's become quite topical over the last five years. The last five years, most of the papers have been on showing because we know, you know, the indications for surgery and how we fix these and whether it's minimally invasive or not, that's, that's um, the surgical side, but the, the medical side, it's quite a lot of research into the use of bisphosphonates, calcitonin, and denosumab. <laughs> One of the biologics, but it's shown to <clears throat> bind the rank, rankle aminoglobulin, and uh, that then stops the activation of osteoclasts. So those are the, the sort of three medical treatments, and that's how it works there. Um, So this is quite a common question for TUTs exams and um, just general knowledge and also for your practice because it's quite common that a patient presents to casualty and they get this diagnosis of cellulitis. They get put on Augmentin or an antibiotic for two weeks and the swelling and the um, redness doesn't go away. And what they really had was... Um, it's just a developing Charcot foot. And they carried on walking on it, and then the foot became completely unstable and collapsed, whereas they just needed to be offloaded, put in a wheelchair, and with a total contact cast. So 
the question is whether it's an infection or if it's an acute charcoal foot in a diabetic patient. Both of them have erythema, both of them have swelling and crepitus. There may or may not be an ulcer. But for the those that haven't been in my firm, because I've most most of, in most of you would have been asked this question in the three month block about how to differentiate the two. One is to elevate the foot above the level of the heart. If it's a neuropathic joint, not, then the redness which should decrease because there's increased capacitance in the in the perfusion or the vasculature of the foot. Capacitance means that it's just hyperperfused, all the vessels are open. So when you elevate the foot, then uh, the blood will drain out. But if there's um, an infection, then it'll remain red. Of course, the other means are um, blood markers, CRP, white cell count, be much more raised with... Um, with an infection. And when you really don't know, you can get an MRI. It becomes a bit difficult to distinguish because it just looks like a train smash. But if there's an abscess or a big collection, that's usually you know an infection. And you can you can use um technetium scans or indium label white scans, which I, I have used once or twice. <laughs> mm. Um When it comes to staging of the um, Charco foot, there's the Iconol's classification, which I think is is relevant because it leads on to another topic of when to um, when to to operate on these patients, and when is it safe to operate on these patients. Um, the the three stages you got to know, and um, it's obviously starts with fragmentation. And this is a time when you can be pretty preventative and put the patients in a total contact cast, get them off their foot. And uh, and you may get away without a radical surgical reconstruction. And then the coalescent phase when the fragmentation stops, becomes more stable, can begin weight bearing, still got to be protected. So these patients often need protection for six to 12 months. And then bony consolidation. And the goal being just a stable plantigrade foot that's not collapsing. The Brodsky classification <clears throat> is also important because it's just an anatomical classification of where the process is occurring. The most common is the type one, which is the midfoot charcoal. That's where that, that midfoot collapses. And then the type two is the hindfoot charcoal. So that's tail and navicular dislocation and subtalar joint. These ones usually become very unstable and um and uh, and often require quite a complex reconstruction. And then the type three, which is the ankle involvement, and sometimes it's a combination of a type three and a type two. And then there's a new one, a type four, which is four foot charcoal, which is quite rare, but I've seen it a few times now. It looks like osteomyelitis, but it's actually just changes in the metatarsal heads. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's just another slide trying to differentiate osteomyelitis from Charco, looking at the sensitivities and specificities, showing that MRI is probably the most sensitive and most specific investigation, or a PET scan, probably the most sensitive. <clears throat> and um, technician bone scan, very sensitive, but very non-specific. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so... The um, indications for surgery in a Charcot foot uh, <clears throat> would be if there's an abscess, you've got to debride it or drain the pus. If there's threat to the skin, so if there's a cuneiform that's pushing plantar or a dislocated metatarsal or tail and navicular joint dislocation that's threatening the skin that needs to be reduced. If there's a um, gross instability with dislocation, or if there's some deformity that's unbraceable that you just can't manage without a, a major reconstruction. And um, the Charcot surgery is very simple. There's just four things we do. One is to do an IND. The other is to lengthen the Achilles tendon or perform 
flexitonotomies on the on the on the toes or to perform an ostectomy so that's just removing plantar bone like you can see in this case <clears throat> this is quite a stable midfoot charco but with um quite a prominent cuboid there which was just taken out with a lateral incision and then major reconstruction or corrective surgery this is where the very severe deformities and um and gross instability here so these are some some of the cases here fixed with um a hind, hind foot nail taking it out the talus you can use a combination of internal fixation and external fixa fixation and um <clears throat> the uh once you get to a situation like this where mary's angle is completely broken with uh different different patterns often the cuboid is sitting very planter like this and um the cuneiforms and the metatarsals are sitting dorsal or the naviculus planter. This is a long, uh, 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 very tough situation because the foot's very shortened and it can be a hell of a difficult thing to, to reduce this. But it's been shown that if you reduce and can maintain the reduction in Miri's angle, then the chance of re-ulceration is reduced by about 89%. So to get a to get an orthrodesis and reduce Mary's angle is the goal. We must reduce reduce the deformity, particularly when it's something like this that's totally unstable. So it, the global trend is is um, we know that with these situations, you don't always get a complete fusion or complete orthrodesis. So you need to have very very stable internal fixation. And so um, a lot of the companies now have developed these super constructs or extremely rigid internal fixation, sometimes combine it with, with a fine wire fixation for a period. Um, remember, these patients often have osteoporosis, pretty shitty bone, quite hard to get fixation. So these super constructs have become sort of the gold standard in treating these very unstable situations. Uh, um so in this case a very strong plate with multiple screws you don't worry about crossing joints and with um getting right across from the first metatarsal to the second you just want a really stable fixation and um and get a good union here with this patient like this patient uh, Mary's angle nicely nicely reconstructed in many of these cases they have an unstable subtalar joint you go back here you can see the subtalar joint was in, in severe vulgus and subluxing anteriorly. So we had to perform a subtalar fusion as well. This is a crazy situation in, in a guy with bilateral Charco and um, subluxation of the subtalar joint and uh, getting recurrent ulcers underneath the tailor head here and um, got a reasonable, not an oil painting for sure, but this guy's still walking around five years later. He hasn't had an ulcer since. Nice and stable, um, but definitely not a foot model. There's another patient with that same pattern with the Brodsky type 1 and maybe type 2 because of the tendon of the joint and then fixed with a, a superconstruct. Now, the, the main um, tenant of the superconstruct is is intramedullary beaming so this is these are called beaming screws and then plating as well you see the subtalar joint was plated in this case here. so yeah there's another another um super construct case sorry this is a case that um when i was first starting these to to do these these cases at um Krutzke, um beaming was was quite popular but i realized that if two things one if you don't reduce the deformity properly and if you don't provide enough stability <coughs> it all starts falling apart like this lady you can see miri's angle is just not reduced and it although it was much better than this immediately after the op and she she re -ulcered. and so um we had to put about two kilograms of metal in there again to get a proper super construct and she's remained ulcer free the last couple of years but treating Charcot patients is a bit like spine surgery it's a 
gift that keeps on giving, even though you think you, you you're out of the woods and you pack, just pat yourself on the back and you say, Jesus I really struggled with this operation. And uh, you get the ulcer to heal and they look good and they go back to work. This is a teacher at um, Rondebosch. She was so chuffed that uh, she could walk again. The ulcer had healed. And then um, two years later, she came to see me. She said her ankle was getting swollen again. It wasn't sore because she wasn't you know, pretty inset. And here she's developed avian of the lady Taylor. And Taylor's is disappearing. So... Um, yeah, just when you think you're out of the woods, these things these things change as well. So it's quite an unforgiving, um, unforgiving situation. Many of these patients require prolonged support, even though they have a plantigrade foot. You still, I think, in many instances, need to support them, um, and you need a good, good cooperation with your orthotist and prosthetist to make these sort of crow boots or cam walkers or diabetic walkers or or um, AFOs. Okay. Just going to go back and see if there's anything else on that. Um... No. I think I pretty much covered it. Just the summary of Sharko. Uncommon. These are the indications for surgery. The etiology is the two theories, the autonomic dysregulation and micro repetitive microtrauma theory. The conservative initial treatment is offloading total contact cost, decrease the inflammation. Three theoretical medical treatments that, that may help. And then um the goal being a nice stable plantigrade foot with at least as little risk as possible and these are the surgeries we perform and um and these are some of the examples so are there any questions on um on shaco guys are quite a quiet group tonight eh? hi bro it's selma hi selma are you coming to my firm man yes bro i'm coming to you <laughs> Yes, my question is just, do we know why the midfoot is the most affected region? I mean, one would think the weight-bearing region should be, you know, mm. uh, be the, but do we know why it affects that area, that region the most? Because, uh, I mean, the, the pre x rays had shown initially there was, like, dorsal, mm. you know, maybe micro fragmentation there before it collapsed completely. Mm. Yeah. So it's not that it's first the midfoot break and then that happens, you know, something. But do we know what that process is there? I think it's because if you look at the gait cycle, you know, just after heel strike, then flat foot, that period when you are flat foot and your body's moving forward and you transition from flat foot to toe off, there's a huge torque through your midfoot region. And I think that's when, you know, most of the bending motion is happening in, in the midfoot. Remember, with all of these patients, all of, almost all of them, they have tightness of the gastroc or the Achilles or combination. So they already have like quite a stressed midfoot. Okay, so okay. I, I, I think, you know, it would be be nice to like iron out like a, put the science behind it, but that, that makes sense to me that it's, that's why it's most common because hmm. you see that rock bottom sole and that's, yeah. that's the, that, that, that's interestingly is the one that if you catch it early, you can treat them non-surgically for sure. Okay. When they, when it's a Brodsky two or three, when it's involving the ankle and the subtalar joint, then they very rarely manage without surgery. You have to do a have to do a fusion there. And then when it when the ankle's involved, it's usually a TTC. Sometimes the talus disappears and you have to do a TC. But uh, the midfoot is the one that if you put them in a total contact cast and you prevent that that rocker. Or that bending, you may get away with a stable because it. If you look at the X-rays at twelve months, eighteen months after the shock up, shock up is just like a block of bone. It's like a stable arch. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you can prevent that collapse. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Prof. Cool. Prof, can I ask? Yeah. 
So, I mean, I think shark is quite synonymous with diabetes. The, the few that I've seen, it's always sort of been the diabetics. Um, and brittle and poorly controlled. Do, do you insist on a degree of control before you take on these big cases? Um, or how do you how do you assess them? Well, an HbA1c less than 8 is, is meant to be the benchmark for for reduction in complications. But when you get a, a an acute dislocation and there's threat to the skin, you you know you don't you, you can't really mess around. You've got to get you know kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, and you have to reduce yeah. the dislocation and take take the, the threat off the skin. Then, um, some of my colleagues, there's a woman from Scotland. She's a wizard with the MIS type surgery, so she can get away with a lot of you know the soft tissue complications or wound healing problems. She just uses a like a burr, like quite a big burr, and she basically mushes up the bone and then puts on uh, puts these beaming screws on and and a, and a frame. Um, obviously, that's taken away a lot of the risk. Eh? But you know, interestingly, yeah, many of them are br brittle diabetics, but some of them they just have a low grade diabetes for twenty years, and then they they suddenly. Get the shock of H HBA one C of five six, um, but of course all those reversible factors, those patient factors. If you can't change them, then then you should. The the one thing I didn't get onto was the timing of surgery. So historically, you just never operated in the fragmentation phase, but it's been shown now that you actually should operate in the fragmentation phase if there's a dislocation. Because the the surgery becomes so much more technical and difficult the um, the longer you wait, and the complication rates no is no different. Eh? But if it's a um, fragmentation with a little bit of a sag, then you just wait and see, and then um, and then address them surgically when the diabetes is better controlled and the and when they're out of that initial phase into the consolidating phase. Eh? Right, thanks. Okay. Diabetic ankle fractures. Well, sorry, Pop, uh, just one more question. Sure, how's it? Um, sorry, it's me, Zama. Just a quick one. Yeah. Just your threshold yeah. for ablation. It looks like some of these cases, I don't know whether it's some sort of deep infection that's quite radical and difficult to manage, yeah. or these constructs that, you know, crumble and fail after patients complicate or like with mm. recurrent like complications when do you i don't know it's, it's, it's quite a as you mentioned it gets that keeps giving so yeah what's taken so um if you have a amputation as a diabetic so well say you're over 50 and you have an amputation you your mortality at five years is about 70 percent yeah? So it's not a joke losing your losing your limb if you're a diabetic. It's probably multifactorial. You know, you've got pretty bad macro microvascular disease, end organ failure. But so, uh, but I think the very few of these patients manage with a prosthesis. They just don't have the limb control and limb and limb strength. So they you, you commit them to a wheelchair or you know, their mobility is is very different. So the the take our message is to try and save these these feet. I mean, even this guy, um, I promise you, this guy's still walking around there. This guy. I can't believe it. Yeah. I see him every year. He comes for a follow-up. He still he is literally walking on that. And um, you can sometimes surprise yourself with, with what salvage you can do. But when it gets to a point, obviously, when it's threatening the limb, threatening the life of the patient, then you you, you have to proceed with them. Um, or if the multiple surgery is becoming so costly, so onerous on the patient, and then then you have to ablate it. But to be honest, and I'm not a big shocker king, I don't want to, I much prefer the, you know, sports medicine and stuff, but the, um, of the, all, the, all the shockers I've done, I've only one patient I've had to do an amputation on. And one or two are critical. I've been with a with a rampant post 
surgery infection, but it's it's they they have um there's a fair resilience. It's that it's just treating the deformity and then the deformities recur and then you have to take a metal out and change a TTC to a TC or whatnot. But yeah, look, the, you've got to try and save these legs for these patients because once they get an amputation, then oh, their life's quite a lot worse. So. But I'm I'm going to touch on amputations a little bit at the end of this talk. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just touching on ankle fractures and diabetics because you know we we treat a ton of ankle fractures and we don't always appreciate those ones um, where there may be an underlying um, neuro neuropathic situation or chronic diabetes. These are serious injuries in, in these patients with a very unstable situation with a often glycosylated brain, so they don't listen to you and they cannot be non-weight bearing. It's just impossible. I don't know. We tell them that you, you know you, you you've got to immobilize this. You can't walk in it. The patient's 100 kilograms, but they just cannot. They, they need to get to the toilet. They need to stand up. They will always stand in it. So um, they also have a poor immune system and um, and and all of the above. But uh, I think the important thing is to to recognize if there's a if there is a shocker or or a neuropathic process on the go because I think it's a situation where there's certainly an indication for a primary arthrodesis or a primary fusion if there's a severe fracture dislocation or a quadrimaleolar type of fracture or bad trimaleolar with dislocation you know it's going to be way too much surgery to to get this thing stable and uh, in and and there would be an you know an indication to to perhaps do a fusion and just remember these patients take twice as long for the bone to heal they need twice the fixation twice the stability often osteoporotic osteopenic um, I mean, Lu Lushon in his pay, he's from Baltimore. He showed that he treated, tried to treat diabetic ankle fractures in costs, and he showed a hundred percent of them displaced in costs, and that um, vast majority landed up with non-unions or malunions, which which then often led to amputations because of ulceration. And so these, even though it, like it goes against what we're thinking, staying out of trouble. With, avoiding complications but with a, a, a diabetic or a neuropathic patient with the ankle fracture is a very serious problem and actually has to be treated quite aggressively um and obviously high high amputation rate with open fractures there um yeah these are the kind of things you do multiple syndesmotic screws and um and and don't have a have a low threshold to to do a TTC or a hind foot nail in a in a bad um, sort of trimalleolar fracture. Um, yeah, and uh, these are the different types of amputations. You're talking about um, amputating feet. You know, we we tend to get the vascular surgeons doing most of these, both in private and and at Critiskeer, but um, you know, from ray amputations, transmetatarsal amputations, list rank amputations, and so forth. But um, you can, if you can preserve the hallux or most of the hallux with four foot amputations, that would be the goal. Remember, if you do um, excise one of the you know the, the first ray then you need to consider the tendon transfers that are necessary to to keep the foot mobile so remember tip ant and the perineus longus insert into the first metatarsal so if you do a, um, a four foot amputation a list rank amputation you've got to do a tendon transfer of the tip ant to the top of the foot otherwise they, they develop an equinus contracture um, and it often requires releases of the achilles tendon as well to to balance the foot it's not just um cutting out the um, infected bone but 
with all of these cases, it's the same principle is to try and keep as much length as possible, keep as much of the, the foot as possible. But once you know, that planter um, skin is gone and you um, you can't get a decent weight-bearing skin on the sole of the foot, then, then a BKA is, is the only way. Symes amputation is a... Is an amputation that I've done in kids a couple of times, and I've tried to do it in adults, but it, it just doesn't work. It's um, basically advancing the heel pad um, over the over the the um, calcaneus, but it's a uh, sorry doing a um, talectomy, but um, that tends to cause the pad to migrate, and it's not a really good option in adults. I haven't had a lot of success, but the Advantage being that you don't need a, a prosthesis to walk around and you've got quite good specialized skin to walk on your on your heel. There are other um, alternatives like the Boyd and the Piggeroff, but uh, once once the hind foot becomes necrotic or involved, then um, yeah, I think a BKA is, is the only way. But, um, yeah, I don't have too much to say about amputations. I don't do a hell of a lot, but... Uh, yeah, anything else? Any other questions, guys? Uh, Prof, I've got a question just a mm. little bit it's a little bit random, but I've read a I read a thing before about shock or oh, sorry, diabetic nephropathy being a, a mm. indicator or a poor prognostic indicator for shock of foot. So do you ever you know look at the renal function and, and everything rather than because I say that they can, you can use that maybe instead of looking at hba one c in terms of diabetic control. So just like as a as as part of the workup. Yeah, I mean I haven't like specifically used that as as a gauge to how they would respond or how bad the diabetes is, but I guess it's really just a reflection of target organ disease. You know, obviously retinopathy, ne nephropathy, and um would be the primary organs that get get drilled, but I haven't read any papers. I'd like to see that, you know, with the correlation of how bad the Charcot process is and um, and renal disease. Maybe maybe there's some link with that activation of the rank rankle pathway and 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 autonomic dysregulation. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, there are lots of theories. Like there are lots of things that are misunderstood, I think, when it comes to the metabolism of the local bone in um, in that charcoal process. But yeah, I have I don't. I mean, of course, most of these cases are going to get a U and E, and then when they um, when we've got a bad creatinine or, or urea or both, then you're going to get a nephrologist or or a physician to help manage these patients. But yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are theoretical. The denosumab, it's twenty thousand rand a month to um to to use that by logic. And I can't see many of these, you know, our certainly our state patients getting that prescribed just with the, the theory that it'll calm the shock process down. But yeah, I mean, these are just things to put in your exam answers. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, yeah, thanks, Prof. I think it's a lot, a lot of it's actually more medical anyway than yeah, than orthopedic. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I'll go one more question, Prof. Sure, Ben. Um, so I'm also just wondering, sort of going back to the same idea I asked before. Um, so a lot of these are diabetics, a lot of them will have uh, peripheral vascular disease. Like you said, the Charcot's may have increased pulses, but it could also be um decreased and you'll you'll have vascular surgeons assessing your patient. Do you ever sort of use their involvement as a as a guide to how far you prepare to go? So if, if they say, listen, they're not going to do anything, any intervention yeah. to improve, yeah, improve perfusion, then you sort of change your plan or step away. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you're um got a situation where you can feel these bounding pulses, you often you you know got a shocker situation, you can feel like oh, feel the dorsalis pulse and the tibial pulse. I don't worry about getting a vascular assessment, but in a situation where it's um, they have, let's say, a diabetic ulcer and uh, under the sesamoid bone and 
it's um, it's not really a shocker, but they've you know you need to you need to release the gas drop or Achilles, and you need to cut the sesamoid out, and you can't feel any pulses. That's one hundred percent. I'll get a vascular assessment in that situation, and then in many cases they'll do an ABI and um, toe perfusion index, and of course Doppler studies. And then they'll reperfuse that limb either with a bypass or with um, stenting. And then they'll say, listen, this thing's got like a 80% or 90% healing potential with, with, with surgical intervention. So if I can't feel pulses, or if you get that, you see those trophic changes and it's, um, you know, hyperperfused hyper limb, then 100%. And it and can be quite remarkable how they can. Um, change the perfusion with a with a stent. I mean, yeah, I mean my colleague Dirk Hoffman, no, he's di not a diabetic or anything, but he was complaining of calf pain and one day he went for a walk and his his, his foot just turned whiter. And he had an, an acute popliteal occlusion. And Peter Swanepoel that afternoon in uh and put a stent in there and within ten minutes of the stent being in his foot was pink again. And um so when they can find that blockage and just re reperfuse the foot before you do any surgery, that's obviously first prize, and that, that's when I get them involved there. Okay, great, thanks. But you, yeah, with with bounding pulses, which is often a, what you get at these um, Sharko type pictures, um, then you know you know not going to really be that helpful. Oh, thanks. Prof, just another question. Um, in private, do you guys have like um availability of like hyperbaric oxygen like chambers? Because there's been quite a lot of um case series and smaller things that have looked at individual cases of how like diabetic ulcers are improved and chances mm. of amputation are, are decreased, but obviously comes at a cost and yeah. afford that. you guys have access to that in private yeah there is a there is a chamber in um in bergfleet <clears throat> or retreat and there's another one in belville but yeah it is it is pricey and um the patients that usually get to do hyperbaric oxygen sessions are those the ones who have done the research themselves that kind of found it i don't generally refer them there but absolutely i think if there's uh something non-invasive that doesn't cost too much that you can afford or some or will be funded that can maybe help then um then i advocate there is that there's that um that, that option i mean some of the some of the sportsmen you know they, they go and jump in these chambers you know all of these things are quite hard to prove you, you need very large numbers of patients going in the oxygen chamber and large numbers of patients not going in the oxygen chamber and then seeing if it makes any difference. So these things, they've never really been proved in, in big sort of randomized studies there. But of course, if it's your own foot and you've got, you know, you want to throw the kitchen sink at it, I don't think, obviously not going to do any harm, but you know, there, there are those resources. <laughs> I mean, if, it, if you think about it, when you if you're breathing room air, what's 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 your what's your oxygen sets now, is that it? Now, yeah, uh, probably one hundred percent. Probably ninety-eight yeah. to one hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so if you take oxygen, how can you get more than one hundred percent oxygen? <laughs> you can't. Uh. So I, I, sometimes I don't understand. Maybe if we live in the high felt or something. And all your lungs are crap, then perhaps oxygen, hyperbaric oxygen will increase your oxygen tension. But if your saturation is 100%, how can you get more oxygen to your tissues? So, this is my, my cynicism. <laughs> like Botox. Yeah. Prof, um, I just uh, want to ask um, <laughs> um, Yeah. Um, when would you rather do a hind foot nail instead of uh, uh, like a augmented plate fixation and diabetic foot? Um, mm. 
Yeah, so um, to to do to do a nail like this, you don't need a tremendously big incision. You can you can have quite quite a lot smaller incisions. Um, the plates, of course, the incision needs to be as big as the plate, and some of these plates are huge and and bulky, and and um, of course they have multiple locking options, and it's very stable in that. But uh, you need quite a big incision that comes with its own wound problems and dissection issues, periosteal stripping. So um, the there are hybrid hind foot techniques as well um paragon and some of the other companies have come up with these straddle type plates which you use a bit like beaming or the super construct of the midfoot where you use a nail and a plate you know some of these very unstable situations one or two steps and that nail starts getting a bit loose so there are there's a hybrid um, system where you can use a, a nail and a plate but to answer your question i with these unstable hind foot situations, I tend to use a nail more now. I've got like a nice way of getting good fixation, good compression, and not interfering with the biology too much. Getting good, um, good, good compression because these nails have internal compression and external compression, so you can get quite a stable situation. And as you know, with like a long bone fractures, you know, what heals better is a is an interim dallary device over a over a, a plate with a lot of stripping. So with a stable with an unstable hind foot, I tend to use a nail. But yeah, you know, it's not 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 so easy. You've got to reduce the deformity, get the heel underneath the tibia again, and get the get the foot plantar grade. It's, it's, you know, these it's one of the hardest surgeries with the least reward is the Charcot stuff there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh... And like in a diabetic ankle fracture, um, when would you opt for a like a, a hind foot nail rather than a plate? Does HbA1c guide you in that at all? Well, are you talking about a diabetic fracture where you're going to consider a TTC or a fusion or um, or RFA? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So um, uh, either a TTC or, or um, RFA, when, when do you make that call? When you have a, a situation where you know the surgery is going to be two hours plus to reconstruct everything, if it's a very unstable uh, fragility type of fracture, so a trimel with subluxation, a lot of comminution, when there's a, let's say, a highly complex fibula that extends proximally and a subluxation that requires an X fix temporarily then those are situations certainly in a in a diabetic i would say would be best treated with mini incisions and then a hind foot nail it's uh it's probably boils down to more the fracture complexity obviously the patient's sort of diabetes status is important and and then you can you know you can pick up a neuropathy or you can pick up if they've got an autonomic dysregulation by your examination. You can do the position sensing of often do it and you can move the toe up and down. The patient doesn't feel it. And you know they've got a, a neuropathy and you're probably better off getting a very stable situation with a with a hind foot nail. So it would be, you know, based the decision would be based on the fracture configuration and stability. And then, of course, the host being a pretty bad diabetic. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the first, the, the, what do you think the problem with uh, doing fusions in patients with a uh, with a neuropathic foot? Yeah? Um, so you uh, altering the the um, forces on, on the foot, so um, probably more prone to developing ulcers. Well. Um, you you basically kick the can down the road so that the next sort of unstable segment or next joint being at midfoot or or um or the hind foot midfoot junction is at risk. So as soon as you make a segment stiff, then then there's a possibility of the of the of the of the instability being transferred somewhere else. So 
that's the one downside to fusing you know let's say the ankle for, for instance so, and they don't they don't feel it they can just start developing a rocker bottom foot yeah. and um so you, of course you know you want to try and get a get the ankle repaired like this you know multiple syndesmotic screws quadricortical just get it that would be the first price is to try and get an RFA. but when it's a very unstable situation and, and, and often those sort of trimalleolar fractures where the plafond is, is sort of in, uh, sloped up on the lateral side or there's an impression fracture on the plafond then that would be an indication to do a nail on. Okay, yeah, thanks. <coughs> cool, guys. Back to uh, trick or treat. Eh? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Okay, cheers. Eh? Thanks, Rob. <laughs>